listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, nah, no, nah, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic, we do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even some ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Nana Akue, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it today! I, 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 I... Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank, and of course, fun, every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice, we are here for you on radio, television and online across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. It's official. If you protest about migrant hotels in your area, you are a far-right racist. I'll discuss that suppression of free expression and speech. We'll talk about the tax burden. It's going up at all levels. Council tax, income tax, dividend tax. We'll ask, is there any prospect in a month's time that Jeremy Hunt might just see sense? And remember, please, it's Valentine's Day. Yes, Karen Moody, back in the 1980s, set up a dating agency. I'd never heard of them, but she's made a great success of it. She's going to tell us the real secrets to partnership success and long, happy marriages. Well, I'll tell you what, if we get that bit right, we'll be a huge success. But before all of that, let's get the news with Polly Middlehurst. Nigel, thank you and good evening to you. And we begin this news bulletin with the news that's coming to us, that a British person has died in Ukraine. We understand from Downing Street, the UK government says the family has been informed and is in contact with local authorities on the ground. Well, that coming as the Prime Minister announced a national one-minute silence to be held in the UK to mark the first anniversary of the invasion of Ukraine on the 24th of February last year. And NATO has been discussing support for Ukraines, including the possibility of sending fighter jets after they have seen a fresh Russian offensive in the country and said as much yesterday. The Secretary General, Jens Stoltenberg, said the alliance will do all it can to help the war-torn country. We need to ensure that Ukraine 
uh, uh, gets the weapons uh, uh, it needs uh, to be able to uh, retake territory, liberate the lands and win this war and prevail as a sovereign independent nation. Here, two serving police officers will face misconduct cases over the way they handled reports of indecent exposure by Sarah Everard's killer. Former Met Police Officer Wayne Cousins is behind bars, serving a whole life order for murdering Sarah Everard, and has admitted three counts of indecent exposure, one of which he committed just four days before her death. The Independent Office for Police Conduct says the new cases involve a Met Police Constable and a Kent Police Sergeant. The government's to launch an inquiry into the sinking of a migrant boat in the English Channel last year in which four people died. 39 others were saved following a major rescue operation off the Kent coast in the early hours of the 14th of December. The Marine Accident Branch says the investigation will focus on the emergency response of the UK team. Turning our attentions to Turkey now, and more than 41,000 are known to have died following the earthquakes in the south of the country and along the border with Syria. UK charities and organisations are to send emergency supplies worth more than £350,000 to Turkey eight days after it happened. And Syria's president told the UN today he's happy to open two more border crossings for an initial three-month period so emergency aid can enter from neighbouring Turkey. Lastly, here the King has been meeting volunteers from the UK's Turkish community. They've been sending aid to their home country and to Syria in the wake of last week's earthquakes. King Charles visited a West London charity to see the efforts of residents working to help those left homeless following the disaster. He told them how deeply sorry he was. He also visited a pop-up tent in Trafalgar Square named Syria's House for Syrians to come to and pay their respects for lost relatives. You're up to date on TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. You're with GB News, the People's Channel. Time now for Farage. Good evening. Well, last night we talked about the protests that took place in Knowsley, Merseyside. Last Friday, we had a local resident on the programme. He made it clear the people who went to that protest were mothers, fathers, aunts, uncles, grandparents, kids, people genuinely concerned about what was going on within their community because a migrant hotel had been filled up with a very large number of young men. And they all say that young girls, underage girls, have been approached and propositioned on a regular basis over the course of the last few months. They were standing up for their community, they were standing up for their family, but a bunch of yobs turned up with balaclavas, black outfits, backpacks and smashed in a police van and set fire to it. There were also a counter-protest that took place from an organisation called Care for Calais. And it's been all too easy to denounce those that want to stand up and raise a reasonable point to denounce them as being far right. Well, as I said to you last night, nowhere could be further from being far right than Nosley in Merseyside, one of the probably most left-wing constituencies in the whole of the country. Well, undeterred overnight, an alliance of charities, they claim up to 500 different groups and charities, have come together in a refugee coalition to urge the government and all those in public life to condemn the attacks on refugees. Well, first things first, there were no attacks on anybody, whether they're genuine refugees or illegal immigrants, there were no attacks at all. It was a peaceful protest. And the Merseyside police today, I'm pleased to say, have confirmed that it was a peaceful protest. But later on, people came in and brought violence with them. And I'm just astonished that what they're basically saying, what these organisations and charities are basically saying, is that you cannot in any way register your concern about your community, your concern about what is going on. And there's an irony to all of this, because you've got charities like the Refugee Council and many others. And they, of course, are in receipt of public funds. They're in receipt of taxpayers' money. 
So you are paying your taxes to government that fund organisations that tell you you're not allowed to express your own opinions. You're not allowed to speak your mind. And this is now spreading far and wide, because down in Newquay, in North Cornwall, again, there is a peaceful residence protest planned for this Saturday. And I'm astonished that the Conservative Council leader in Cornwall, the Labour Party in Cornwall, public voices in Cornwall, have already branded this protest a racist protest. It is absolutely nothing of the kind. Free speech is being suppressed in the most astonishing way. And virtually everybody is afraid to speak out. It is sinister, it is bad, it is wrong. And it's being done, of course, because, firstly, you've got those who are clearly completely mad, who think that everyone that crosses the English Channel is a genuine refugee, when, of course, we know huge numbers came from Albania over the course of last year to go straight into criminal gangs. There is also the sheer unfairness of those that legally want to come to this country as opposed to those that pay a criminal trafficker and come across the English Channel. At no level is this fair, is it reasonable, and overwhelmingly the British public wants something done. And yet, civil society, our political class and much of media are coming together to try and stop us speaking our minds. Tell me, am I wrong? Is this a genuine suppression of free speech? Give me your thoughts, farage at gbnews.uk. Well, I'm going to make you one promise. Whatever the threats, whatever the abuse online that comes, I am not going to stop highlighting this crisis. You see, I've seen what has happened in Sweden. I've seen what happens if you allow huge numbers of young males to come into your country, young males coming from entirely different cultures, young males coming from places where women are not even second-class citizens. So I am not going to be silenced by this mob, but I need you out there to use your voices with your MPs and your councillors as well. What is going on is wrong, it's unacceptable, and it is, without doubt, the biggest breach of the Brexit promise, which was we would take back control of our borders. Now, is this situation going to get any better? Well, I suspect it may even get a bit worse over the course of this year. Four boats cross the English Channel today. That's another 200. That's another hotel. That'll take us up somewhere between 450 and 500 hotels that are booked around this country. And they're coming at roughly 200 a day. They've come for the last seven consecutive days because the weather has been really good. It'll worsen over the weekend. One thing for certain is that the French authorities have been stopping a lot more boats than they were before. And that leads to a consequence. And Mark White, our Home Affairs editor, has put together this report predicting where boats are going to start coming from in big numbers over the course of this summer. Racing out from the French coast, a local lifeboat crew responding to reports of a small migrant boat in difficulties. But this incident, also involving a French border patrol vessel, is far away from the usual small boat routes out of Dunkirk and Calais. In fact, we're south of Boulogne, more than 50 miles from those routes. It's one of dozens of rescues the lifeboat based in Berk has attended in recent months. A major uptick in activity as people smugglers attempt to avoid increasing police patrols further north. The numbers have been rising. At the end of 2021, we were involved in many migrant rescues. During 2022, there were significantly more migrants. The further they have to travel by boat, the higher the risks. Travelling from down the coast brings extra dangers. Being in the water for longer brings the danger of hypothermia and even being hit by bigger boats. 
For the people smugglers, increased police activity around Dunkirk and Calais has made their regular launch points more difficult to operate from. French authorities are also busy erecting miles of extra security fencing around those beaches, and that's driving the small boats further south. For years, the criminal gangs have predominantly used the shortest route to the UK, pushing off first from the beaches around Calais, then expanding to include areas near Dunkirk. While occasional boats have been launched further south, in the past six months, this route, using beaches near Boulogne, has seen a significant spike in activity. With a beach even further south, near Fort Mann, also now regularly being used. And for maritime patrols in UK waters, that means a far greater likelihood that small boats will begin showing up on a much longer stretch of UK coastline in the year ahead. Well, that very much confirms a point that I've made to you on this programme over and over and over. It's all too easy to blame the French, but frankly, to police about 60 miles of beach and hundreds, literally hundreds of square miles of sand dunes would take tens of thousands of police or soldiers. You can puncture as many migrant dinghies as you like. More will get manufactured in China and in Turkey and arrive. People will keep coming all the while they know that if you pay a criminal trafficker and come to the United Kingdom, your chances are being returned anywhere are less, probably about 5%, maybe 5%, maybe even less than that, maybe 2 or 3%. So people know if they come via this route, they will be allowed to stay, and all the while we're part of the European Convention on Human Rights, that will remain. In a moment, a different subject. We've talked about it before. It is the expansion of the ULES zone right to the edges of Greater London. Opposition across the political spectrum is now building, but does that opposition actually have any teeth? Can we beat Mayor Khan in this great battle? Colin Smith, Conservative leader of Bromley Council, joins me in just two minutes. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. And no reason to go to bed. So I guess I've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Co. You're uh, an inspiration to us all. Clip that bit off. Well, you are. You, my, you, you, no. <laughs> my political ambitions are, those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes to have one. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Co. Come and join us. GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubery, weekday evenings at 6 o'clock.
I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers <laughs> tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. We are GB News, the People's Channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Well, your thoughts on this suppression of free speech? If a migrant hotel comes close to you, don't complain or you're a far-right bigot. That's the message we got overnight from a whole load of taxpayer-funded charities. Some thoughts. One viewer says it's the charities that need to be stopped. Well, I tell you what, we should stop funding them, I think. Yes, I really do mean that. David says debate is desperately required, but it will never be allowed. David, you're wrong. I'm not going to stop, and I hope you don't either. And put pressure on your MPs, on your councillors. Let's talk about these things. Otherwise, what's the point in voting in any election? Erin says they shan't come to the table for discussion. They merely want their way, attempting to subvert people's right to protest. Erin, I'm afraid you are right. Now, let's get back to you, Les. We all know that in the 1950s, London had horrific problems with smog. There is little doubt that the Clean Air Act in the early 1950s made a fundamental difference to this city and to people's way of life. But when it comes to the congestion charge and then the extension of ULES out to the South and North Circular, well, maybe there are some marginal benefits for the environment, though I rather doubt it. It just turns out to be tax on most people. But even if there are marginal benefits, I'm convinced that extending the ULES zone right out to the edges of Greater London doesn't work for many reasons. Now, David Lammy, one of Khan's great cheerleaders, says we'll just get public transport. But actually, out on the edges, you can't get public transport. You need a car. So ULES comes in on the 29th of August. It'll be £12.50 to leave or to come into Greater London. If you're a nurse on an overnight shift in a hospital just inside the boundary and you do the overnight shift, it's going to cost you 25 quid a day. Opposition is mounting. Interestingly, now four Labour MPs have spoken up against it. County councils all around the edge of London are now speaking up against it. They're all saying they won't have the ULIS cameras sighted in their counties. Well, they won't need to, because the, actually the cameras will be on the boundaries. And some of the London boroughs have woken up. Indeed, Bexley... Bromley, Harrow, Hillingdon and Sutton, interestingly. Sutton's fascinating because it's run by the Lib Dems, who in the London Assembly all voted for it. But never mind, never mind, Sutton Council is opposing it. I'm joined by Colin Smith, Conservative leader of Bromley Council. Now, when you go right out to the end of the, the, the southernmost point of the Bromley Borough, the Westrom Hill point, you are, for the whole of Greater London, at the furthest point from where we are now in Westminster. Khan says that Bromley Borough is one of the worst boroughs in the whole of London for people dying of lung diseases caused by pollution. What do you have to say about that? Well, first of all, Nigel, thank you for having me on. <clears throat> um, regarding Mr Khan, um, he's talking arrant nonsense. We know in Bromley that we have the cleanest air in the whole of the capital bar Havering. We're very marginally second to Havering. We know in Bromley that our air is cleaner than any of the boroughs already ensnared within the Mayor's Eulers. Mm -hmm. And we simply know that what he's attempting to do is set up a network of cameras across London so that at a flick of a switch, a time of his choosing, 
he can introduce road price charging, which will absolutely collar everyone, whether you're driving a non-compliant car, a green car, a hybrid or whatever. So do you see the ULES extension as, as a beginning of road pricing in London and perhaps across the country more widely? Absolutely. Um, he already is employing people at City Hall to map it out and scope it. Mm -hmm. um, council leaders, those of us that are preparing a legal challenge at least, have now seen maps of where he wants to put the cameras all across our boroughs. And I have to tell you, it is an impenetrable network. You will not be able to plot your way around it. Even through country lanes and all the rest Absolutely. of it. Absolutely. So, you know, if you live in a country lane... Um, Which I do. Yeah, indeed you do. Um, you will find, and you obviously know some of the outskirts of mm. our borough, um, in the most remote spots in London, you will see cameras being put up um, that will basically, as you say, charge people £12.50 no. a day going about their daily business. Doesn't bother me tuppence, Colin, personally, because I've got a nice new car, I can afford it, I'm on a good income. Doesn't affect me at this stage one little bit. But those that have got older cars, those that are on lower incomes, those that are retired, they're the ones that are actually going to pay the price for this. An estimated revenue of up to £400,000 a day. It's big money, isn't it? It's awful. And whether it's... I've had some really, really sad phone calls, really tragic stories of businessmen who have mm. sunk £20,000, £30,000 into buying a van, two vans... They're really scared because they don't know where they're going to get the money from to replace the vehicles they need to replace. And that is, of course, even if they can source them, because there's a shortage, yeah. particularly around the Euro 7s. Um, yeah. So there's that on the one hand. Uh, but uh, ironically, uh, the Lady uh, Secretary General of Unison, of all people, I heard passing this message this morning, which struck me as slightly ironic. The care networks all across London, you've got the scenario of a son living in Seven Oaks yep. going to see a mum in Beckenham. Yeah. Twelve pound fifty, twenty-five pounds if they stay overnight. It's yeah. it's scandalous because people No, just can't we've already it. seen people saying they're gonna retire, they're gonna pack up. But Colin, here's my here's the real point of this. You know, it's all well and good you getting together with other boroughs and Sutton flexing their muscles and county council saying what they're saying. And, boy, we were in Luton last Thursday, and even there, you, Les, is, is a realistic. It's all well and good. You as elected council leaders saying what you're saying to Mr Khan, you know, questioning his data um, with, I think, very good reason. But where's the teeth? Where's, your, where's the threat? I don't see any threat here. I mean, no, why don't you just tell Mr Khan you will not allow those cameras to be put up in Bromley Borough? Nigel, we speak quietly and we hope we're carrying a big stick. Um, well, what is the big stick, well, then? <laughs> the big stick is the four boroughs. Yep. Um, and Bexley, Bromley, Hillingdon and Harrow. Mm. Croydon have shown a keen interest, too. Mm. Mm. Uh, we have been undertaking legal preparatory works and the news on that will be released very, very shortly now. So, is the, is the debate here whether Transport for London just have the power and the authority to simply put these cameras there against the wishes of, say, your borough? Yeah, the, they can unquestionably put their kit on things like traffic lights. Every traffic light in London is TfLs. They will strongly argue, and the law tends to suggest, that they can put their kit on borough roads. We will see. Um, all part of the legal conversation to be had. But I can't vote for Transport for London. Uh, no, you can't, can you? Isn't it a shame? Uh, <laughs> isn't it a shame? <laughs> but I, I can vote for you, and I can vote for I, your council. You can, you can. So what does this mean for local democracy? Uh, frankly, it's struggling, isn't it? You have a mayor acting... Well, he's out of control, frankly. How far will you take this, Colin Smith? Uh, Nigel, we will take this as far as the law permits in law, and if we come up short... Personally, and I've already been calling for it, we've seen the government intervene in Scotland recently. It can be done. I think there's a real case for the government stepping in, stopping this. People can't afford it. It's not fair. It's not right. And I think if I could leave one message to your viewers tonight, yeah. it would be to please, please pressurise Labour MPs Labour councillors... Well, four have broken ranks already. In, it, it shows you what's happening out yeah, there. Yeah, they they yeah. are under pressure and they are cracking. And the more pressure we can apply, 
the greater the chance of Khan changing his mind. Well, Colin Smith, for the sake of local democracy, making voting at local elections actually matter for the sake of tradesmen and women driving in and out of that zone every day on behalf of the poorer people, the retired people, please don't give up this fight. That's a promise. Splendid. In a moment, we'll talk tax. Oh, I nearly forgot. How much is your council tax going up? Um, I'm sad to say it's going up by 4.99%. Oh, 4.99. <laughs> In a moment, we're going to talk about council tax going up, the tax burden being the highest for 70 years, and we'll ask what is Mr Hunt going to do in the budget in four weeks' time. All of that in a couple of minutes. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Join me, Nana Akue, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it today! I, 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 I... Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank and, of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me and the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. I'm joined by John O'Connell of the Taxpayers' Alliance. I'm sorry, folks, he's got really bad news for all of you. You see, we hear a lot, don't we, about income tax and what's going on and, and, and you know, the freezing of limits and we hear about corporation tax and all the things I've discussed at great length on this show over the course of the last few months. I don't think I've mentioned council tax once. John... What's happening to our council tax? Well, thanks for having me, Nigel. Um, yeah, bad news. It looks as if um, most councils across the country are going to increase council tax starting in April. Um, there's a cap at which council tax go up, can go up, and then after that cap, there's a local referendum. And guess what? It's uh, going up right just below that cap of the referendum. Most councils are putting it up by 4.99%. As Bromley, as we learned a moment ago. Absolutely. So call it 5% between yeah. friends. So most councils, your council tax will increase by 5%. 
for an average house, 120 quid, something like that. Yeah, I think about a, an average band D property of 5% council tax increase is looking at 100 to 120 pounds extra on their bill, yeah. which at this time when inflation's so high, you know, the cost of petrol, the cost of uh, energy, you know, heating their homes, it, it, 100 quid is a lot of money for mm. most families across the country. But in the case of Farrock, in Essex and Croydon, it's going up by much more than 5%, Yeah, isn't Thurrock, it? Slough and Croydon have got a special dispensation to put it up by even more. Because, because of the incompetence of their own leaders? Essentially. A Section 114 notice was given to Thurrock Council, which meant that they're essentially bankrupt, to, you know, for, for want of a better phrase. And they were written to financial auditors several years ago about their so-called appetite for risk, and they kept playing property speculator with taxpayers' money. Yeah, and the, and green, and the green scandal that indeed. took place with Solar down in Thurrock. And is there anything people can do about this increase? Well, there's several things. I suppose that they can put pressure on their local councillors. Another thing that um, people can do is log onto their councils' websites, go through the spending that councils yeah. are forced to publish, and be an armchair auditor. Find the waste themselves and take it to their local councillor and say, cut this out of the budget instead of putting the tax But the argument is that it's social care costs that have gone up so much. Yeah, there, there's a... Pre and, and, and there is some legitimacy in that argument. Absolutely. Councils are responsible for enormous social care bills, yeah. uh, adult and child, and yeah. it's important to say that the social care precept is a small part of that increase. I think it's two of the 5%. So okay. in terms of social care, you could sort of say fair enough, particularly when the national system is such a mess. Yeah. Um, but when we're talking about other parts of uh, councils' budgets, absolutely residents can log on, find some areas of wasteful spending and hold their councillors to account on it. Well, have a go, folks. Yeah, become armchair accountants. <laughs> More generally, John, you know, the tax burden, we understand, is the highest it's now been for 70 years. I mean, since Clement Attlee mm -hmm. was Prime Minister in post-war Britain. Uh, we also have a very big debate about corporation tax going up by nearly 30%. Big announcement at the beginning of this week, AstraZeneca, who were going to invest 330 million in Cheshire, have said, no, we're not doing that, we're off to Ireland, where corporation tax is much, much cheaper. Firstly, the Conservative government were criticised for reducing taxes too much. Now they're being criticised for increasing taxes too much. And I actually thought Quarteng and Trust, they may have mismanaged it, but I thought they were on the right track. Do you think as an organisation, as a Taxpayers Alliance, there is any chance of Hunt rethinking some of these tax rises? I think the AstraZeneca Astra news was pretty big. I mean, choosing to locate in Ireland is indicative of the corporation tax rates there of 12.5%, but guess what? Ireland's going to grow by nearly 5% this year. Yeah. Um, rates that we could only dream of. So, um, you know, when, when we're looking at that, when growth's anemic, productivity's bad, it seems to be the one tax that um, backbench Conservative MPs are now taking to mm. Jeremy Hunt and Rishi Sunak mm. and saying, look, putting corporation tax up by six percentage points when we're desperate for inward investment, for jobs and growth, is absolutely crazy, and, and we would back that. Um, you know, corporation well, tax ought to be low, simple, and encourage investment in the UK. Will they listen? We don't know. John doesn't know. I don't know. Jeremy Hunt, well, maybe he hasn't yet made his mind up, but on the 15th of March, in the budget, we will find out. Now, a quick What the Farage moment. The Prevent review from William Shawcross that was out last week. And my name wasn't up in lights. Indeed, Trevor Kavanagh wrote him a son on Monday. It would have been much too obvious to mention Nigel Farage. But now we know from Shawcross that actually he revealed that training material for a workshop about the extreme right wing profiled Nigel Farage's Brexit party, now known as Reform UK, and included pro-Brexit and centre-right commentators. Folks, the Brexit party was a coalition of people on the centre-right and the centre-left of politics. We had lots of people standing for the Brexit party who'd been active members of the Labour Party. I formed it to try and bring democracy back to the UK. I genuinely don't think that at any point Anything I've said or done has posed a terrorist threat. But whilst they were busy with all of that, as we've learnt, they ignored, too often, severe Islamic terrorism. And seven of the last 12 atrocities committed in this country were committed by people who'd been referred to prevent and they hadn't done their job. It makes me really quite angry. And finally, on What the Farage, last week we told you that churches here, including the Church of England, are considering what the gender pronouns 
for the Father, for God should be. Well, a church in Pasadena, in California, where else? They've gone one step further already and put a great big sign up outside their church saying, God's pronouns are they, them. Yes, they've gone the whole way in that mad state of California, but they're very pleased and proud of themselves. And they boast about what a wonderful, inclusive, diversive, modern, spiritual church they are. Well, I have to say, it doesn't convince any of me, and I just think what will happen is we will see church congregations falling and falling yet further. In a moment, it's Talking Pints. Folks, it's Valentine's Day. Yes, absolutely, and Karen Mooney in the late 1980s set up a dating agency. Virtually none of us had ever heard of them at the time, but they appear to be quite a success. In a moment, we'll find out why. Coming up on Dan Wooten Tonight. As it's revealed Harry and Meghan are working with wealthy Hollywood business gurus, do you believe they are motivated by humanitarian causes or money? Esteemed biographer Tom Bauer weighs in. Plus, vaccine victim John Watt asks why his and so many others' plight is still being ignored by the mainstream media. And Nigel Farage tackles the migrant crisis. Don't miss Dan Wooten tonight, 9pm to 11pm, only on GB News. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's already in waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Hi, Andrew Pierce here. Join me every Friday lunchtime for a proper no-nonsense debrief of the week's events. With special guests in the studio and the GB News team on the ground, I'll be getting you up to date with news, some intelligent discussion and my own sharp take. The weekend starts here with me every Friday lunchtime on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even some ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Lawrence Fox, on GB News. Frank fun, fearless, and sometimes serious. Much as I love a Friday night punch up, what I really want is a battle of ideas. I want to look at things differently. I want to hear different voices and engage with your unique experiences. Every Friday at 7 p.m. on GB News. It's time for Talking Pints on Valentine's Day. And Karen Mooney joins me wearing her heart. 
um, jumper to match my heart tie. Welcome to Thank the you very program. much, Nigel. Thank you for having me. No, not and at happy all. Happy Valentine's Day. And to you. Now, way back in the 1980s, yes. you founded Sarah Eden Introduction Agency. I did, A yeah. dating agency. I know. And I think, were you the second firm doing it in the country or something like that? Yeah, literally. I mean, there was Dateline. Yep. Um, but there was nothing like it. That was computer dating, of course. But, you know, I was in my 20s and people were finding it difficult to uh, meet people. Why? And um, Because we were all working so hard. And the last thing you wanted to do when you finished a long day in the office um, was really to stand about in a wine bar and be chatted up by some oink or whatever, you know? Um, so I started Sarah Eden um, for young professionals or professionals to meet like-minded people. And when I first heard about dating agencies and we talked about it with the boys, we sort of kind of thought, well, that's for losers. We'll be being unfair. Yes, but it's interesting you should say that, Nigel, because when I first started, people used to, we used to have to convince people that it was a sensible thing to do, that it wasn't for losers, it was for people who were making a discerning decision that they wanted to meet somebody who was an equal, um, who had as much to bring to the table as they had, um, and, you know, they could be... Uh, they, they could meet somebody that they wanted to be with for the rest of their life. Um, it was a bit, I used to say to people at the time, it's a bit like if you want a house, you go to an estate agent. You know, if you want a partner... I mean, you were way ahead of the, you were way ahead of the curve on this, weren't you? I know, you? yes. You, you really were. <laughs> and I don't think I could have done it if I hadn't been in my 20s at the time, you know? So you I saw the need for it, you did it, it was a brand new concept. I mean, these days, I'm struck, sort of the traditional way people used to meet, going back, you know, 70, 80 years, yeah. was at dances. Yeah, you know, yeah. Hall dances on Saturday nights or whatever. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Seems to me that most people these days meet through work. Um, it, I think a lot of people used to meet through work. Yeah. Um, and, and they probably do still now. But um, I think if we go back to the um, back to the 80s, it was... P roles were changing. You know, we women had their own careers, they had their own mortgages, they had their own... You know, it was the first time, because in the 70s, you had more clearly defined roles, didn't you, for the man and woman? Um, I think that's probably true. Yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah. fast forward to the 1980s. Yeah, and it was things a little are bit changing. More difficult. Yeah, and things are changing very, very quickly. Well, you were way ahead, as I say, you were way, way ahead of the pack. But something else that's happened since you set up your dating agency all those years ago. Something came along called the internet. Yes. Yes. And that seems to have changed all of our interpersonal relationships in yeah. the most extraordinary way. I mean, people are abusive towards each other <laughs> on social yeah. media in a way that they rarely be towards each other in the street. Absolutely. But there are upsides to it, you know, all sorts of incredible upsides, information you can find and things you can learn. So there's up and down with all of it. But the apps, the apps, the Tinders, the Grinders or whatever yeah. takes your fancy, all these different apps that appear. So how does a traditional, which I, I'm going to call you that, maybe tell me I'm wrong. That's fine. Yeah, the new era of matchmaking. So, 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 so how do you compete now against... What's the difference between you and these apps? OK. Well, first of all, when the internet came al along, it actually brought dating into people's homes. So it was really actually quite good for us. It took mm. away the bottom end of the um, dating, if you like, you know. Going back, back to the 90s and things, we often used to get... And dirty phone calls and things, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't anymore, you know, because anywhere there was lots of women working, they would think that. Um, and then, of course, the apps came along. Um, but our people, they're all financially secure. They want to meet somebody that can bring as much to the table as they can. They want to meet people who've been met. Um, so if they meet through Tinder, it's for different motivations, is it? It can be, yes. <laughs> yes! Well, you've seen the Tinder Twins, haven't you? No! <laughs> oh, no! You I'm not going to admit to that! No. No. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's very interesting. But let's just suppose, Karen Mooney, that I come to you yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. I, I send you an email to your website, or whatever it is. What's the process that I would go through with you? What would I have to pay you? How would it work? OK, well, you come to... You'd email us, we'd send you details, we'd ask you lots of questions um, about, about you and the sort of things you want out of life. <laughs> and then we'd make an appointment for you to either come to our Westminster office or our Windsor office. Oh, you'd physically meet? Yes, we physically meet. It's important, I think. And people have really liked that since the pandemic. You know, 
in the pandemic, we learned to use Zoom and all these other video platforms. And we can, still can use those, but people actually want to meet in person because they want they miss the interaction with a real person. And how do you spot when they're lying? Oh, easily. About their, whether it's their financial means or the job they do or... You can find a lot Because there are a lot of water mitties out there, aren't there? Yeah, well, if they, they hopefully don't come to us because we ask them for three forms of ID. We do our own checks as well. And um, uh, they're sitting down, they're talking to us. And as you said, you know, on the internet, you can find out so much about somebody now. Mm, mm. Um, so if we don't, we've been in business, it's our 35th year now. If we think somebody's lying, we're not going to put our All right, so I come to you for the interview. Yeah. Then we ask you to sign a confidentiality contract because we do have a lot of high profile people on our books. Do you? Yep. Do you really? Yeah. Yeah. Aren't but, they worried about, you know, the press finding out that they've been to you or Not so much, no. Not so much now. We change names and things, but you know, and we we don't have to use photographs if we don't want to. Um and once you sign a confidentiality contract, we'll make a selection of people we think would be suitable and then you select who you want to meet from there. And we have different membership options too. So uh, we've got a very high success rate. And how expensive is this? It starts, including VAT, at £6,100 for one year's active and one year's uh, frozen, which is actually very reasonable if you think about it. It's well, it less... sounds like <laughs> money yes. to me. But but... If we're going to find your partner for life, it's definitely worth it. And you know the people you're, mes you're meeting have been vetted and, you know, we have a close relationship with our clients so we keep in contact. No, I believe you. And, you know, we, yeah. No, I believe you. But, yeah. So what are your big successes? Come on, give me some examples. Give me two or three examples of big successes that you feel that you've had. We've had a double generation success. Double generation? Yeah, the first, the first couple came to us um, and they, it was second time round for both of them. Then we had a big 30th anniversary bash uh, a, couple, a few years ago and uh, they came along. And uh, he said, my son's an airline pilot, he can't meet the right sort of person. So he put, um, phoned his son, put his son on the phone to Debbie, my manager, and he came along and he's now married with a baby. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic, they had to put their marriage off twice. Yeah, that happened to so many people, didn't but it? So many people, yeah. but they've got yeah. a beautiful, beautiful baby. Uh, so what's the age profile? I mean, is it all young professionals that come to you? No, God, no. Uh, it's our oldest member at the moment is eighty nine. No. Yeah, no. We we <laughs> we've got lots of older members, and it's fantastic. Eighty nine. I think, if I'm honest, Nigel, I think the pandemic made people think about life, and think about the future, and they want to make the most of it now. So you know, eighty is the new sixty, I believe. I'm guessing that the pandemic must have led to an epidemic of loneliness as well. Of course it did. It was it was amazing because I went into the pandemic and I didn't know, you know, what, what was going to happen. No idea. And um, we started Zooming and children, you know, children of older clients mm. Mm. were teaching them how to use WhatsApp yep. and all sorts of things. Yep. And they were actually going on virtual dates. And it was lovely because it stopped them being lonely. Virtual dates. They were yeah. going on virtual dates. I guess so. yeah. You know, they could. Yeah. The, you know, walking it, when you went out for your one hour's walk a day, you were allowed to at the time. They could walk together on WhatsApp and you know speak to each other. Um, so people became a lot. The people became very clever at finding alternatives. We even had quite a few of our, our clients um, having meals together. You know, they'd Zoom and yeah. one of them would cook something, they <laughs> one would cook something else. So it stopped them being so lonely. <laughs> now, I do not believe that you've had 35 years of totally untrammeled success without the odd disaster along the way. What are the most unsuitable matches that you've put together during your um, career? <laughs> God, I'm trying to think now. Um, uh, well, we have had a couple of divorces, obviously. Yes. Yes, of course we and, have. And, and also, didn't you match somebody with their ex-husband or ex-wife? Yes, I did. Yes. <laughs> yes. Gosh, yes. It was really funny. Um, I yeah, I interviewed this chap and um, I took his profiles up to him. And he said to me, you're obviously very good at this. I said, why? He said, that's my ex-wife. <laughs> I was married to her for 25 years. <laughs> right, so as far as you're concerned, you're 35 years young as a business and it's yes. going to go on, it's going to continue. Absolutely. And is this all across the Western world? 
these sort of agencies, America, Europe? They're, they're on the... They're on the, the... People are wanting to come to offline agencies a lot more now. Dating fraud went up in... Which report that came out in June 2021, it was up 40% um, in the pandemic. Interesting. You know, Interesting. Um, Interesting. It, people have to be going to, if they have to go into it with an open mind. And that's why people like coming to us, because they're meeting people who've been met, who they know have been vetted. And, Karen, outside of all this, you spent a bit of time working at Buckingham Palace. Tell us about that. I did, yes, a long time ago. Gosh, a different world ago now. Yes, I was in charge of the civilian staff. And, gosh, you know, you think of all those years that the Queen was there. Oh, I know. And I remember... The day of her funeral, well, I was at Canada Gate doing some broadcasting and the amazing procession, the coffin, the hearse and all the staff coming out of Buckingham Palace yes. and lining up outside. It was a very, very moving it moment. It must have been. It, it must really, have really been. was. Very moving moment. Well, Karen Mooney, all I can say is congratulations on what Thank you've built you. and what you've done and being a pioneer. Thank you. Um, and I've learned something tonight. That, that can't be a bad thing. And happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's yes. Day. And if I ever need you... I know exactly where to come. Fantastic. Thank you. Take care. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>